Hey, very good morning to my friends and family from Brumley Baptist Church. Welcome back to Sunday School this week. Take a Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter number 15. If you're in your quarterly, we are on session five of our summer series, page 46. And the title of the lesson this week is Return. Repentance of sin can stop its spiraling effects. Uh, where we left off uh, last week, not uh, not super happy place. Um, Self-serving decisions, painful decisions, the breakup, the division of the kingdom. Uh, we're going to look at the other side of that coin when God's people decide to repent, to look at it the way God looks at it. Uh, those effects can be stopped and can be turned around. Uh, and we're going to look today at a man named Asa. Uh, and what he did that was right in the Lord's eyes. And because of what he did, the return that comes back. Uh, good things are going to happen here in our text. If you have your quarterly, if you read on page 47, I'm not going to read that to you, uh, but you'll get a lot of the background information that will lead us into our lesson today. Um, I like to give you guys a chance to, to read through that and kind of set yourself ready for there. These Sunday school lessons are great. You could use this quarterly as a uh, devotional book. You know, each day read one of the main points of the Sunday school lesson, read the background information, pray over that passage, read that passage, study that passage. You know, God's word is a never ending supply uh, of gold just waiting to be mined uh, if you're willing to, to go in there and, and dive in and do the work. So I pray that you do that uh, week by week, uh, church family. Let's start today with chapter 15, verse 9, uh, wholehearted. In the 20th year of Israel's king Jeroboam, Asa became king of Judah. So remember, these are the two divided kingdoms. And he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Makah, daughter of Absalom. Asa did what was right in the Lord's sight, as his ancestor David had done. He banished the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols that the ancestors had made. He also removed his grandmother Macaw from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. Asa chopped down her obscene image and burned it in the Kidron Valley. The high places were not taken away, but Asa was wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his entire life. He brought his father's consecrated gifts and his own consecrated gifts into the Lord's temple, silver, gold, and utensils. Uh, according to 1 Kings 14, during Rehoboam's rule, uh, in the southern kingdom, Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Uh, Rehoboam, uh, in much the same way that Jeroboam had done in the northern kingdom, had, had done wrong things. Um, eventually, we get to Asa, who is the leader here in our passage, and he rules for 41 years. Uh, David was the unequivocal standard for kings. I mean, and that just makes sense to us. We, we know that from all these years away from it. David is what a king should be to God's people. And so there's always going to be some of that comparison back to King David. Um, this tells us that in verse 11, Asa was more like David than his predecessors. And so that is already off to a good start, a better start than we have been. Uh, Asa did what was right in the Lord's sight. He banished the prostitutes. Um, it, obviously, you understand the evil that is associated with prostitution, whether it be male or female prostitution. Uh, Asa removed all the idols his ancestor had made, made. When it says he removed them, it literally in Hebrew means he destroyed them. Um, this wasn't a small thing. Solomon had 700 wives. Most of those wives built shrines to their gods. So you just do the math there and you realize if he destroyed all of those, that was a big Herculean task in of itself. Um, he removed his grandmother. Uh, the queen mother was a uh, strong influence on the king. And because the terrible thing that this queen mother, you know, quote unquote, had done, he removed her and burned her idols. You know, when it's family, sometimes that's hard to do. It's hard to step to your own family and say, hey, you shouldn't be doing these spiritual things, yet he was not afraid to do that. And then fourthly, and maybe most importantly, uh, in verse 14, he was wholeheartedly devoted. You know, it's one thing to make edicts and decrees and to have a lot of these things done. 
It's another thing entirely to be a follower of Jehovah yourself and for people to see that in you, to see you following Jehovah, to see you doing the things that are in the Lord's sight, correct and right and holy and just. And so that's, that's who he was and what he did. And so we're off to a good start. Wholehearted is a very good heading for this first section of scripture. Secondly, our heading is cornered. There was war between Asa and King Basha of Israel throughout their reigns. Israel's King Basha went to war against Judah. He built Ramah in order to keep anyone from leaving or coming to King Asa of Judah. So Asa withdrew all the silver and gold that remained in the treasuries of the Lord's temple and the treasuries of the royal palace and gave it to his servants. Then King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, son of Tambrion, son of Hezion, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, There is a treaty between me and you, between my father and your father. Look, I have sent you a gift of silver and gold. Go and break your treaty with King Basha of Israel so that he will withdraw from me. You know, when when these kings get into these uh, conflicts with one another, there's a lot of things that happen. War, uh, conquest and ideas and battlefield strategies, but then also political maneuvering. And hey, you come be on my side and then I'll be on your side the next time you do something, kind of these back and forth uh, sort of things. And so that's a lot what we see here. We see um, a a ongoing war between Asa and Basha. Uh, Basha is the king of Israel and Asa's neighbor to the north. Israel and Judah were battling over the boundary that separated the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Um, Basha came south and fortified Ramah, which was about three miles across that line, just really close to kind of the the demilitarized area between the two, the border right about where they would join together. It was a north and south route. If you controlled that, you could keep anyone from coming or going to see King Asa. Okay, it's basically the road that led straight to his capital and his throne and him, you know, he himself to be able to go see and go talk to. So this was an important um, uh, place specifically. Uh, So Asa turns to a man named Ben-Hadad, who was king of Aram, a nation that bordered Israel from the north and was a very strong nation of the day. Um, Asa sent Ben-Hadad a bribe and said, all the silver and gold of the royal palace, I'll give you all these things, but I want you to to kind of be with, with me. Um, I, I want you to break your treaty with King Basha, who I'm now fighting with. Remember, Asa's fighting with Basha and kind of come and be with me. If you take a chronological Bible and lay Second Chronicles alongside this, uh, in chapter 16, uh, the, there's a prophet of God that speaks to, to King Asa and basically tells him that this is a wrong thing to do. It adds a spiritual kind of layer to this. Again, this is one of those things where all of a sudden now he's depending on worldly ideas and worldly concepts instead of godly concepts. Uh, he's cornered. He's backed you know, into a rough spot. So how's he going to react? What's he going to do? Well, we're going to see thirdly that it is resolved. Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel. He attacked Ejon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Macaw, all Chinnereth, and the whole land of Nefalti. When Basha heard about it, he quit building Ramah and stayed in Terza. Then King Asa gave a command to everyone without exception in Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timbers Basha had built it with. Then King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mitzpah with them. Ben-Hadad, having received the bribe and having listened to Asa, asked for help, asking him for help, responded. He sent commanders uh, to the cities of Israel. These are high-ranking generals. These are good soldiers, and they take care of things. Uh, Basha was focused on one city, Ramah being his stronghold, and all of a sudden now he's got all these small fires and all these other cities that he has to go put out. So he, he backs away from Ramah. He basically takes away the blockade where people couldn't get to Asa anymore and um, ends basically the conflict. What happened is that Asa basically chose his own strategy rather than God's protection. But even within that negative sort of situation, the writer of 1 Kings still puts Asa in a favorable light. 
Now, he made mistakes. He certainly didn't do exactly what God had told him to do. He didn't rely and trust in God himself. Um, but he did do many things that were much better. We have to remember, apart from Jesus, every person we read about in the scripture is flawed, is a sinful human being. From the best to the worst, they're all written for our examples, where they're written for us to see what they did, to learn from their mistakes. We are only to emulate Jesus. And so we just have to keep that in mind. This situation eventually gets resolved, um, even though it probably was not handled in exactly the best way. What can we learn from the text? Well, we can learn that God expects the leaders to follow him wholeheartedly. Not part way, not halfway, not some of the way, but if God calls to us, then we should follow him wholeheartedly. And that should not be a shocking thing or a, um, you know, that, that ought to be normal. God's people should just expect to follow him wholeheartedly in everything they say and do. And you should expect your leaders to do that, whether it's King Asa or your Sunday school teacher or your pastor or your fellow church member. Those who serve God need to do so wholeheartedly. Believers facing difficulties must guard their hearts. And we got to be careful. But for any of us, we can become worrisome and lean on our own understanding. Don't trust our own hearts. Don't trust our own emotions, but follow God. Why? Because God is always emphasis, always faithful. Next week, 1 Kings 18, proven. Uh, this is a great story uh, that I'm really looking forward to. Only God is worthy of our worship, and we will find that very true when Elijah and the prophets of Baal have a showdown on the top of Mount Carmel. Hope that you can be here and join me for that next week. Again, Wednesday nights at 6 p.m., Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. are our uh, weekly gatherings. Uh, we are making our way through First and Second Kings. All of these lessons that we have done to this point are available right here on YouTube and on Facebook. You can find those if you need any help. Email me at pastorbillycrow at gmail.com. I'd be glad to help you locate or find any of those. Would love to have you come join us in person sometime, but most importantly, until I do see you, or I'm with you again. Have a good and godly day and go serve your king.